Hello, this is Haka Dabin, and today we are going to the back rooms to read about three entities. If you like this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to your channel. Now let's get right into this. Starting with Entity 23, the unapproachable a horse. There are some actions so un so terrible that atonement is impossible. That redemption is unobtainable, and that forgiveness is unreachable. Those unfortunate it, it, it's who have their very souls blighted by the actions that they commit have no need for the punishment of others, for they have already given their lives to exist as husks, moving silently through the purgatory that the rest of us call life, never again, never again seeing or feeling or being. They have already had their fill with poison of their own design. Entity number 23, Habitat, Spares. Description. Entity 23 takes the appearance of a dark brown horse of unknown gender and age. This entity has been sighted on a variety of levels, but is most commonly seen on levels that take the appearance of natural spaces such as forests and fields. It is unknown if the entity has the same movement and restraints as wanderers, as it has been sighted on a large variety of disparate levels without ever being seen to no clip between them. This entity has a unique property and it's never able to be approached. At all times, the air within in a radius of 40 meters or 130 feet around the horse is completely inaccessible. The mechanism that prevents wanderers from approaching the horse is not understood at this time. With any wanderers who attempt to get who approach the entity, reporting that they, they are still able to walk or run towards the entity, but never get any closer to it. Additionally, any time the horse moves in the direction of wanderers or entities, those that end up in the horse's area of effect are physically displaced to an area beyond it sometimes clipping through walls and other solid objects. All this occurs appears to be an outside observer. Although this occurrence appears to an outside observer like wanderers or entities being physically pushed by an invisible wall, wanderers who have been affected by this don't feel as if they are being moved, but rather that their environment is being moved around them. Biology Entity 23 is a horse of unknown on gender, breed, and age. Its coat is brown and it has a black mane and a tail. Oh, it is assumed that the entity requires food and water, as many reports of the entity discussed that are grazing on grass or attempting to drink from streams that it comes across. Due to the nature of NC23 and the impossibility of getting close enough to, for, to it for examination, many aspects of its biology cannot be discerned. Behaviors NC23 acts like a normal horse usually not taking particular note of its unusual effect. It will usually spend its time in natural levels, grazing or wandering. And C23 has shown signs of loneliness, such as restlessness and calling for other horses, though it is not able to approach any animals or humans due to its effect. The end of case occasionally has episodes of distress in which it runs through levels at high speeds. This can occasionally be dangerous or unsettling due to nearby wanderers due to the spatial displacement caused by the approaching horse. Discovery. The first report of the entity came from a sighting in Alcatraz Park on level 11, where its unique property was first documented. Due to the property, no one was able to enter the park, and they were only able to see the entity briefly, calling it the Ghost Horse. After some time, it eventually left the park, only to enter a safe distress and trudge quickly through the level, causing many of the witnesses to experience some spatial displacement. MEG operatives from Base Beta attempted to capture this entity with no success. The entity entirely left the level all once all attention was taken away from it. This is the only known event of the entity in a heavily repopulated level, and there have been no further reports of this of the entity in level 11 since its discovery. Do's and don'ts. Do for you prepared for a special displacement if you spot the horse running in a direction. Don't attempt to approach strange horses. That's that just seems like good advice in general. <sighs> uh. 
A single horse stands alone in the middle of a, f of a field. Alone. A quality that need not be specified because it is a quality that has plagued the horse's entire existence. As long-rested neurons make connections in the horse's brain, a face forms in the deep vacuum that is memory. Perhaps the quality of alone did not always apply to the horse, but was applied for as long as the horse can remember, as long as it can bear to remember. The rain above picks up, beating into the horse's skin with minuscule fists. The horse begins to remember a time before, before it was irredeemable, before it was unapproachable, before it was alone. The face in the horse's memory begins to take shape, eclipsing all other thought. And as it sees a young boy in its mind's eye, a deep sorrow washes over it, reminding it of all the pain, all the hardship, and even more painful, of a time when it was happy. That terrible feeling of contentment that I will never feel again. But the memories continue flooding back against the horse's wishes. They are now fully formed in they are now fully formed being outside of the horse's control, surrounding it, suffocating it, and leading it again on this path as an unwilling participant of it in its own past. For Annette, I think we're almost there, the young boy says from the horse's back. The horse says nothing in reply, for it is a horse, and horses don't generally speak. The rain continues to beat down the horse's skin, but the boy seems unaffected. As they were both find, they were not almost there. The horse grows weary as the night grows deeper. Let us stop here for, for Hernando and take a bit of rest. The boy motions for the horse to slow its pace, and it does. The boy dismounts, sitting on a nearby rock as the horse stands idly by, examining the face of the lights of trees and hills that can barely be made out in the evening light. Twigs can be heard breaking as a small doe flits gracefully across the forest floor until an enormous booming explosion rouses the trees around, and those fur is out in a viscous blackness that leads out from its chest. The boy stands still, and the shock of a gunshot so close, but the horse's glasses, the eyes are blind with rage. It rushes towards a large man not far away, which it recognizes as the source of the blast quickly approaching his position. The hunter shoots once at the horse in shock, missing it by a large margin as the shot continues behind it, and the horse knocks him over. Hoof meets skull and gray matter leaks into the mud too fast to be washed away by the rain. The horse turns around at a gurgling sound from behind it to see that the boy had been hit by the hunter's stray shot. Skull fragments are embedded into the he's, he's sky like stars in the spot above where the boy's head once was. No, 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 no. A single tear rushes down the horse's face as it pushes the memory away from its mind. But the boy from inside them is still there. It's okay, Fernando, the boy says from beside the horse. You have to let go now. I know it's hard to deal with the pain in Fernando, but you must forgive yourself. Because, well, there's no other way for you to keep on going. The pain you have inside you, the pain you've been carrying for so long. We all feel that pain to some extent. And if you stop pushing people away, then you'll find that they can help you. The boy fades away. He's done all he can. The horse gives it some thought through its tears. Perhaps just this once, just for tonight, it will try to bring out down its walls. The horse makes its way through the empty streets of Spawn Town and comes across a man. In the darkness, the man looks almost like the boy from the horse's past, though the horse knows that this is not so. 
The man looks surprised at first, but recognizes the horse's pain. Says the things that are ripping their way through the creature. The man wraps his arms around the horse and gives it a hug. But the horse feels nothing. Is this all it is? After all the pain, after all the loneliness, it's finally feeling the contact that it had isolated itself from for so long. That it had desperately hoped would make everything go away, make the suffering numb for just a little bit longer. And this is all it is? The horse is crushed even more by emptiness. The hug brings him and somberly breaks off the embrace. The horse continues on, seeing Signmark Tavern, one of the few buildings open at this hour. The horse walks into a bar. The bartender says to the horse, Why the long face? Get it? <laughs> you are kidding me! What? Oh my god. That was... Okay, we're continuing. Death Rats, Entity 24. When it freaking loads, which is probably going to be never. I don't know. Okay, we're back. Entity number 24, Habitat, Majority of Levels. Description. Death Rats are entities that can be found in various levels of the back rooms, with each population being unique depending on the level it's on. Example, there is a species of death rat that is hairless to bet or cope with the hot temperature of level 2. They seem to have inhabited the backgrounds for many years, starting out as normal rats and slowly changing to better suit their climate. Behaviors. Death rats vary in abilities as they evolve their bodies and abilities to adapt to various levels. Example, in most levels, like level 1, the entities seem to have this screaming effect. On rare occasions, you can hear screaming not from people, but from rats chasing other entities. Lights will flicker during the event as the death rat at stops or the entity is terminated. There are many other types of special death rats, but most death rats are harmless and can be a food source if you're willing to eat one. Somehow, however, some species are very dangerous and will even set traps for you. They are smarter than you think. Biology. The biology of death rats depends and ends on the level they inhabit. But some death rats can look very similar. Or the most common form are, are looks like a normal house rat with a long body and black fur. They also have strange brown horns coming out of their head. That's a red glow on the tips. Most death rats have a diet consisting of male death mods and mold, although most of them can hunt and kill, each kill other entities, see screaming effect mentioned above. Discovery. It is unknown how these entities were discovered, but a group known as the Lost referenced them as the forever changing rodents in their ancient texts. Do's and don'ts. Do. Most are harmless, but it's best to avoid them just in case. Don't try to activate them, it is unknown what they will do. Now we go on to entity number 25 Plague It Goblins. Entity number 25 Habitat Majority. Description: Plague goblins, named after their superficial resemblance to medieval plague doctors, are small, elusive feline avian entities that scurry about the back rooms. They are opportunistic, pack-based foragers that usually, that while usually timid and inoffensive, can be a major can be a major nuisance to for explorers, especially those who travel alone. Get all the information out. Behaviors. <clears throat> Play goblins' behavior is varied depending on their environment, but naturally they are cautious yet oppor opportunistic creatures, scavenging on whatever they find lying about from fruit, from food, scraps of wood and metal, supplies, and sometimes even bones and body parts of deceased explorers and entities. 
They are saturated to plague. These are saturated to plague goblins' cloak and seemingly disappear without a trace. Regardless of the size and weight of the said object, once areas have been cleared, they move on in search of new foraging locations. Alone, a plague goblin and will usually flee at the sight of humans or indies. It's not uncommon for a group to try and steal from unsuspecting explorers when given the chance, particularly those traveling alone, weak, or old. So, the, those of you who have seen those back rooms, what if, if, if such and such person were to go through the back rooms and says the back rooms morphs to be far more accommodating? That's a freaking lie. And I kind of hate those TikToks anyway. These groups typically range from 9 to 27 members and are referenced to as a swindle. Swindles of plague goblins will appear within an entry point, most preferably once situated away from hostile entities within an area of approximately 200 to 500 meters. The swindles are divided into three casts, each with its own distinct role and function. The scouts, the henchmen, and the gatekeepers. Scouts, serving as reconnaissance for the swindle, scouts can be identified by their dark leather masks with glass openings over their eyes and consist of both males and females. At the sight of danger, they will all retreat to warn the rest of the plague goblins. Proceed with caution, as an ambush may follow after. Henchmen, the basic grunt of the plague goblins. The heavy lifters, performing most of the non-combative foraging against at her, at, at her labor. They are comprised of mostly adult males, but young females have been uh, documented. They can be identified by having smooth lights, brown, brown or white masks, lacking distinctive features. These are the most numerous cast members and are always seen in the group. Gatekeepers. The leading force behind the swindle is made up of is made up exclusively of adult females. Gatekeepers can't be distinguished from can be distinguished from wearing a white bread M hat and more refined capes. They adorn highly decorated masks with distinct patterns. Each wields a silver cane tipped with an hourglass. Though this isn't always the case. The gatekeeper uses this device to produce a portal from which its swindle enters and leaves. How it is capable of doing so is currently unknown. Play goblins, while typically nomadic entities, do build permanent lodging. Things at stable levels. These settlements are referred to by travelers as wards. Wards consist of tents built from various items um, the plague goblins have collected. Items include camping equipment, bones and skins, wood, and various fabrics and beddings. There can be from um, 100 to 500 individual plague goblins in a single ward. It is ill advised to try and steal from um, or break into a ward. They are heavily fortified and stocked with traps to ensnare. Air would be trespassers. The reciting plague goblins will also retaliate with extreme aggression and violence. This usually leads to severe injuries and even the death of the said intruder. Plague goblins communicate through raspy croaks, squawks, and chattering sounds. Those at the more hazard le levels rely on complex hand gestures and visual cues. Plague goblins have known to be capable of understanding human speech and rare instances some may eat. A, a sometimes attempt to mimic it to moderate success. This has led to some explorers bartering and even befriending some plague goblins. They, in turn, would provide travelers with supplies and warn them of, of potential danger. Plague goblins are averse to other entities and are usually a sign that a specific area is safe. Yet it is not uncommon for them to fall prey to specific hostile entities that roam the back rooms. The prominent of which is hounds, as they ha are some of the few entities fast and agile enough to catch them. For this reason, Flake Goblins have developed a fear and hatred for this specific entity. Some travelers have reported it, it swindles utilizing traps and weapons to hunt hounds. Be sure to carry hound parts with you to ensure safe passage with any swindles you may encounter. Biology Plague goblins are cat-sized semi-ipedal entities that resemble a cross between a bird and mammal, weighing 8 to 17 in pounds, which is 3.6 to 7.7 kilograms on average. 
Females are generally larger than males, but are visually identical otherwise. Soft black and slings for like feathers cover the entity's bodies, their skilly limbs for are strong dexterous talents for climbing, holding objects, and defending themselves. Beneath the mask is a carpet and like beak full of razor sharp serrated teeth. The eyes are enormous and very reflective, with a bright yellow shimmer in the dark. They sport two long, thin, tufted ears used to detect sound to communicate. <sighs> Despite their mammalian appearance, the plate goblin's internal structure is identical to birds. Traits include air sacs attached to the lungs, a crop and gizzard, hollow bones, and a small keel. This allows plague goblins to run at incredibly high speeds over long distances. While measurements have been difficult, the high speed ever recorded was 52 miles per hour or 84 kilometers per hour. This combined with their agility makes them one of the most elusive entities in the uh, back rooms. If killed, the meat and organs are clean and palatable and can be safely eaten raw or cooked. Although I would suggest cooking because raw meat is just a bad idea in general. A unique trait of play goblins is their ability to consume any form of organic matter. Diets consist of mold, corpses, prepared food, oods, candied, plant matter, and deceased entities. Play goblins appear to be immune to psychological anomalies on most levels. This allows them to colonize levels otherwise uninhabitable for humans. Discovery Play goblins are found throughout much of the back rooms. However, the origins of their discovery are very spotty. The gold's document describing the entities come from a journal left by an anonymous explorer from 2005 mentioning pint-sized plague doctors, frequently harassing them. Do's and don'ts. Do keep on supplies, especially food, on water, and tools close at hand at all times when not traveling. If you find a net as of a if you find signs of a nest and have nothing to trade, leave from where you came. Trade almond water and food if approached. Shout and wave your hand and wave your arms if cornered. Plague goblins are very skittish. If the attack persists, entering and killing an individual entity isn't particularly difficult and will often set a pack into retreat. They will not return, so don't bother following. Try to rescue endangered goblins when you can. Killing a hand or killing a hound or just carrying hound parts is highly recommended when negotiating with Don't leave supplies out of reach or otherwise exposed, especially those with a strong scent. Attack or otherwise provoke a nest, you will never win the fight. Attempt to relax the mask or cloak. Make sudden movements or adverse noises is what trying to approach them. Show them damaged remains of their own kind. This, include ma this includes masks. Give them weapons of any kind, especially firearms. Insult or attempt, or attempt to taunt them. This will provoke a violent response. The last entity we have is Entity 26, also known as Samantha. I was going to stop at 3, but then I saw this one and got really curious. Hang on. Okay, we're back. Whew. Entity number 26. Habitat may appear on any level, but has mainly been seen on level 3, level 5, and level 0. That doesn't make any sense. Level 0 is also not have entities. Hello. Oh, description. NG26, who refers to herself as Samantha, is a feline mammal that appears to be a typical domestic house cat. Though travelers who have come into contact with her are reported to believe otherwise. The, the entity is primarily passive, but can quickly turn violent and unpredictable if provoked. She coaxes travelers into feeding her meat or any meat-based products they, might, they may have with them in exchange for a psychic reading. Using her, 
from her using her abilities. The nature of Samantha's psychic readings varies depending on the quality of the meat you provide her with, ranging from extremely detailed or unsatisfying to exasperatingly negative and vague. Samantha mostly enjoys products like steak, premium fish, and chicken, but seems to have a distaste for low-quality meat like spam and sardines. If not fed anything, even if the traveler is not able to, she will grow extremely violent. Survivors report her attacking like any cat would, scratching, biting, and clawing. Although there have been no fatalities involving Samantha. Behaviors, as well as being incapable of speech in at least three different, at least three human languages, Samantha poses. Uh, Possesses several psychic abilities, including clairvoyance, mind reading, and teleportation. The full extent of her abilities is currently unknown and is being researched by MEG Division and workers. Samantha is eloquently spoken and shows to have exceptional fluency in her speech when communicating verbally. The MEG is currently debating the idea of using Samantha as a method of managing other entities. Biology Samantha resembles a domestic house cat with black and white fur and green eyes. Considering the usual size of adult female cats, Samantha is relatively small, leading some to believe she may actually be a kitten or a runt. Samantha has a strong jaw and abnormally serrated teeth, enabling her to tear through skin and meat with ease. Because of this, her bites may result in, fi in severe physical trauma. Discovery. The first recorded encounter with Samantha was reported by the was reported to the MEG by an anonymous traveler in July of 2020. Said traveler seemed to have known Samantha before their meeting on level three, but they refused to elaborate on their history with her. Do's and don'ts. Do feed Samantha any meat products you may have with you to avoid unexpected complications that could result in severe injuries due to the strength and nature of the entity. Speak calmly and politely to Samantha. Don't try to provoke or anger Samantha on purpose. Don't insult, tease, or taunt Samantha, or speak impolitely to her. Treat the cat with respect. Fair enough. That was a few more Backrooms Entities. If you like this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. I have no idea what I'm going to be doing tomorrow, so until then, goodbye!